Good afternoon from London. My name is Eric Bergloff. I'm the director of the Institute of Global Affairs at the LSE School of Public Policy. We at the LSE are delighted to welcome all the thousands of you from around the globe to this London launch of the Mariam Forum. The Mariam Forum is a collaboration between faculty and students across all of the LSE, involving our partners, New York Times and Kite Insights. The, the Mariam Forum is situated right in the intersection between LSE's motto to understand the causes of things and the ambition in our 2030 strategy to be part of reshaping the world. The two aspirations come together as we're trying to make sense of the world in the midst of a pandemic and in order to be part of reshaping uh, the response to it. The theme for the Marian Forum is from rulership to leadership. So do, what do we mean by leadership? For us, leadership is not only or not mainly about individuals. Yes, individuals matter, but leadership is an ecosystem of research-based policymaking, accountability and inclusion. We claim that there is a leadership gap. We have too many rulers, not enough leaders, and too much rulership and not enough leadership. Th this is true in government, in business, and across society in many countries in the world. And we're not necessarily moving in the right direction in closing this gap. Over the last decade, rulers have in fact been winning out. Even in countries where the, we thought leadership had been firmly established, we see a slide towards rulership. It's happening in emerging economies, it's happening in advanced economies. Some may have questioned these claims of a widening leadership gap when we first launched this initiative in January. But after the arrival of COVID-19, no one can be in any doubt. The virus has been merciless in undressing populist leaders and exposing the failure of leadership at every level. And we see the lack of leadership has consequences. We see it in my own country, Sweden, where thousands of the elderly and their carers needlessly needlessly died prematurely in care homes. And we see it in the US right now where the daily register uh, new spikes in the, day, in the cases of infected and deaths. But most strikingly, strikingly we see it, uh, it in the lack of leadership at the global level. Despite plenty of warnings and time to prepare, we are now rushing to respond to the intertwined medical emergency and economic crisis wreaking havoc in economies and societies and shattering lives and livelihoods in every corner of the globe. Not a single geographic area will escape. The virus respects no borders and no country can on its own end the pandemic. If there's one lesson that stands out from this and other pandemic, it's the need for large scale global coordination. The Marian Forum is a multi-year leadership accelerator to build the kind of leadership the world urgently needs. It's a collaboration between policymakers, students, academics, business leaders and the media with research very much at the center. Driven by deep engagement between students and faculty, the Marian Forum will build on LSE's long track record of research policy engagement and capacity building. Today is the London launch of this leadership accelerator, together with many different parts of LSE and importantly, our students. We have constructed a program around the COVID-19 pandemic. What needs to be done now globally to deal with the intertwined medical emergency and economic crisis? How does the COVID-19 pandemic intersect and interact with other global emergencies and important challenges? How have the different parts of the world responded to the COVID-19 pandemic and what needs to be done now in very different regional contexts? And in the final session of the day, our Merriam student leaders will bring together what we have learned during the day and challenge a panel of policymakers business representatives and academics. How can we close this leadership gap? You may ask, why cram so many sessions into one afternoon? Why not spread them out over a term or even a year so that we can participate in, uh, live in all of them? We want to illustrate how global leaders face multiple interrelated crises in very different contexts at the same time. They must prioritize and make early decisions with many conversations going on at the same time. They live in that messy space between understanding the causes of things and reshaping the world. By organizing all these parallel sessions, we want to bring across that complexity. Luckily, the sessions will be available to watch after the event, and we will return to them as the conversation continues. Before I go into the program for this session, I just want to recognize Khalid Yanari, who has been an instrumental in shaping the Marian Forum and making this event happen. At every point, he has reminded us of the banner for the initiative from rulership to leadership. 
and how this must run through everything we do and how we do it. And he's emphasized the engagement of our students, both undergraduates and graduate students, and that they should be part of shaping every aspect of the forum. I also want to thank, in particular, Karina Stern, who has stepped up as a project leader for today's ambitious event. She has made this event happen together with her collaborators, Jerry Mirich and Nina Lontar, and support from uh, Jake Morris and Jasmine Paul at Type Insights. And our Mariam students leaders have been contributing to every aspect of the program. So thank you very much. Let me come to the topic of today's first session. It's defeating the virus everywhere. What needs to be done now? In this session, we will examine how the two aspects of the COVID-19, the medical emergency and the economic crisis are interconnected. We'll not be able to fully recover from the current economic crisis until we have defeated the virus everywhere. Until we have defeated the virus in an individual country, the economy cannot fully return to normal. Until we have extinguished the virus from the planet, we run the risk of new outbreaks anywhere. We need investments in helping countries fight the virus, and we need to support countries in, in weathering the economic and political impact of the virus. We need to do so on a global scale. Many of us on this panel have been involved in trying to mobilize such a global response. We have seen the G20 finance ministers respond by adopting a global action plan with many praiseworthy commitments but we've not seen much concrete action beyond the responses of individual institutions like the WHO, the IMF, and the World Bank. What needs to be done now from a medical point of view and from an economic political point of view, that is the question for the opening panel. We have an amazing panel and a global audience to help us answer this question. The panel brings together medical expertise, leaders from previous global crises, and policymakers working in the current crisis in different parts of the world. I'm going to introduce the speakers as uh, they speak, but I'm going to start with um, former Prime Minister Gordon Brown, who has been very much at the helm of trying to push the global response in this crisis as it was part of the uh, response to the global financial crisis. It's a great honor for us to have you here, uh, Prime Minister Brown. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, delighted to be part of this new venture by the London School of Economics, and I congratulate you, Eric, and your team on organizing this. And it's a real pleasure to speak alongside uh, Maria and Manoush and uh, uh, Zhu and Andres, uh, and of course, Jeremy, who will follow me. Uh, I was once a university lecturer, and I used to say that universities stand for objectivity, rationality, uh, the pursuit of truth, the search for knowledge. Uh, and these were all the qualities you had to leave behind when you went into politics. And I suspect that the contrast is nowhere more obvious than now between the brilliance of the scientific and medical and research uh, endeavor built around universities, of course, and the willingness of uh, academics across the world to cooperate and the failure uh, of political leaders across the world uh, to cooperate, uh, even facing uh, this crisis. What we've got is a global uh, medical uh, crisis that has caused a global economic crisis. And we know that the economic crisis cannot be fully resolved unless we can address the medical crisis. And we know that the medical crisis cannot be fully resolved in one country or one continent alone. It can only be finally addressed uh, by finding a way to eradicate the disease uh, from every continent. Some of you may remember that uh, Ronald Reagan uh, met uh, Michel Gorbachev to decide on peace plans in the 1980s and reduce nuclear weapons. And Reagan, of course, was obsessed by Star Wars and he asked uh, Gorbachev a question at the Geneva meeting. He said, if an asteroid hit the earth, uh, would you work with us to deal with the problem? And Gorbachev said, of course we would cooperate. And Reagan said, we too. Now, there is nowhere where a Me Too, move, We Too movement is needed more than in the control of infectious diseases. If a World Health Organization did not exist, it would have to be created to deal with problems like this. And Jeremy, I believe, will follow me by suggesting, as I'm uh, implying, three areas where cooperation at an international level is absolutely essential it is happening, but has not yet been fully supported uh, by political leadership. The first is the global search for a vaccine and cure. 
Uh, and it's not just the search for that, it's to manufacture in a mass basis. And of course, it is to equitably distribute that. The second, of course, is when you have at the moment a dog eats dog fight to get hold of medical supplies. And we saw this yesterday with America buying up the supply of a particular drug. Uh, we need coordination so that we can build the capacity uh, to provide medical equipment, not just to the richest countries, uh, but all around the world. And that's from ventilators right through to basic uh, medical uh, protection uh, equipment. And thirdly, and perhaps uh, more important in the next stage is this, that the poorest countries with inadequate health systems, inadequate safety nets, inadequate means of protecting people and therefore social distancing will not work as well in overcrowded circumstances, nor will the desire to call for hand washing work where you don't have a regular supply of running water. Uh, we needed to do more and still need to do more to support those countries uh, that are facing the disease uh, without the resources to enable them to do so. So global health cooperation is essential. I see it on the part of scientists and medics, but I don't yet see the resources being provided. And that then leads to economic cooperation. And I think everybody will be struck by this contrast between the national actions that people have been prepared to take. 11 trillion has been uh, injected into national economies as a rescue operation to stop the effects of the virus, as against the limited international cooperation that is consisted of communiques, uh, but not yet uh, forceful action on the ground with the resources that are necessary. At the beginning of the crisis, Kristalina Georgieva said that two and a half trillion was needed by the middle and lower income countries to deal with this crisis, but only a fraction of that has been provided. And I single out three areas where something could be done immediately, but yet we have failed uh, to be comprehensive in our approach. The first is, if you want to get money to the poorest countries, the quickest way is allowing them to suspend their debt servicing payments. Uh, 76 countries, or about 86 mil billion between now and the end of uh, 2021, uh, 20 billion is owed to the commercial sector, more is owed to the bilateral uh, uh, agreements, some to the multilaterals. But as yet, we have seen limited progress. Yes, some bilateral uh, debt relief, uh, not yet uh, a large amount of commercial uh, debt relief. Uh, the multilaterals uh, have to be supported by, by the shareholders to do it. And some of that has happened, but not all. So debt relief, the quickest way, the route is not yet uh, been exhausted. Secondly, the resources of the International uh, Monetary Fund, uh, inadequate to deal with the scale of the problems that Kristalina herself identified at two and a half trillion. Perhaps the IMF could provide about 600 uh, billion over a period of time. Uh, the best way would be to create the new international currency, the SDRs, a new round of that, uh, 600 billion in the next few months, another 600 billion by 2022. That would allow, if the countries who received this currency were prepared to pass it over to those who needed it, uh, an injection of resources of a scale that is essential uh, for countries to deal with the problem. And the third area is the World Bank and the regional development banks, because they have to provide help for infrastructure, for education, for health, for safety nets. And of course, what is happening now is that uh, education, infrastructure, and to some extent, safety nets are being crowded out because we need to spend urgently on health. The only answer is to increase your resources. During the last uh, uh, global financial crisis, the World Bank trebled the amount of money available from one of its uh, funds. I think the World Bank has got to be able to borrow through its IDA, and we've got to use new facilities like the International Finance Facility for Education to create more resources. Imaginative thinking, new thinking, but thinking that's got to be done. But there are longer term issues as well, and I want to dwell on them very briefly uh, before others uh, come in. This crisis is accelerating trends that are already underway. I, I, I talk about the center of gravity of the world economy moving from west to east. I talk about manufacturing employment and now more service employment in place of it. I'm talking about the physical economy and the growth of the online economy. Other trends that have been underway before this crisis, uh, movement of resources and, and uh, rewards uh, from labor to capital, uh, from the education poor to the education rich. And we still, it is an open question, what is gonna happen? And of course, from a sustainable economy to an unsustainable environment 
uh, where we've got to take action as well. Now, when it comes to the pandemics, we can identify things that have got to be done, but we have pollution, we have nuclear proliferation, we have global inequality, we have the sustainable development goals, we have 80 million people caught in a humanitarian uh, crisis, the biggest figure since the Second World War. Uh, we have issues about the future of the internet. And these are all global problems, nuclear proliferation and other, that need global solutions. And you need to have cooperation. Now, what has actually happened in the last 10 years since the global financial crisis is what was started off as a defensive nationalism, that you close your borders, you put on tariffs, you cut immigration, uh, you build walls has now become an aggressive nationalism america first india first china first uh, japan first russia first turkey first these uh, defensive nationalisms of the last few years have turned into an us versus them nationalist and as you see in this crisis the tendency is to make uh, relations between countries a blame game someone else is to blame for the problem to whip up national sentiment in our favor and what we are finding is neither could the Washington consensus, which is not even supported, of course, in Washington, which is probably the neoliberal approach to running the world, nor nationalism, uh, you, if you like, American first going global, or at the same, or at the same time, an international coalition of anti-internationalists, uh, that is not going to solve all these seven problems I've identified, including pandemics. Uh, nor will what is likely to be the future if we do nothing about it, a one world of two systems, uh, China and America with their own spheres of influence competing with each other akin to, but not the same as the Cold War. The only way forward is by some form of responsible cooperation. And my view is it's got to be built up issue by issue. For those who are despondent about what could be done, look at what happened when we decided to eliminate smallpox, it happened. Look at what happened when we decided to deal with the ozone layer. Look what happened when we said apartheid had to end. Even in the global financial crisis, we won the battle to get back to growth, even if we didn't win the war to reform the international financial system. And that is the spirit in which we've got to address uh, the next stage. You know, in the 1990s, we had had 40 years of a space race, America fighting Russia. And then by agreement, America and Russia and other countries agreed to work together in outer space with the International Space Station. And I believe if we can achieve that form of cooperation in outer space in one of the most sensitive areas that was causing some of the greatest tension in the world, and that could be pulled off for 30 years, uh, then we can, if we put our mind to it, achieve the responsible cooperation that is necessary to solve not just the problem of pandemics, but proliferation, pollution, inequality, the sustainable development goals, uh, and of course the humanitarian needs I've identified. It's a challenge that I believe the intellectual community is wishing to meet. It is a challenge we have got to force on the political leaderships of our time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prime Minister Brown. That was, I think, a, a very powerful uh, sense of direction and many of the issues that you brought up, the intersection between different uh, global, emerging global challenges, the need to coordinate and to try to work maybe on specific issues to build uh, the global cooperation. We'll come back during the day in the other uh, webinars that we are holding this afternoon. So thank you very much for that uh, beautiful start uh, to this con conference. So the next speaker is Jeremy Farrar. Jeremy is the director of the Wellcome Trust, the, I think the second largest funder of research in the world. Uh, he has worked both globally and actually spent a lot of time trying to understand and work at the origin of, of many of these um, epidemics in, in, in working in Vietnam and then has been part of previous attempts to fight epidemics and pandemics and he was involved in the Ebola crisis uh, very much uh, in producing a vaccine at the time. Now you have been active both at the global level and in the national debates in the UK. Jeremy, what is your perspective on this? Thanks very much. I hope you can hear. Um, and uh, Eric and Vinoosh, um, great pleasure to uh, join the LSE in this and uh, a real honour to uh, follow Gordon Brown um, 
we've actually never met, but over the last few months, Gordon, your your leadership on so many of these areas, G20 and others, has been enormously appreciated uh, by those of us in the public health community. And uh, all I can ask is that you continue to keep pushing. Um, your job's not done yet. Um, where to start? Um, I think the last six months has really um, been a remarkable period to live through. Um, when we look back in history, these periods are often romanticized. We look back at events in history. Uh, the truth is when you're living through these events, they're deeply uncomfortable, very painful, uh, and uh, very difficult to get out of. But when you're in the midst of them, it is critical to ask yourself and lift your eyes and say, what does this mean for us as we go forward? Uh, because the future gets defined very quickly. And if you wait, frankly, until it's over, that opportunity to bring, yes, a deep intellectual uh, understanding of the reasons for it and the responses to it is lost. Or even worse, uh, that vacuum gets filled uh, by others with other agendas, uh, as Gordon just outlined so articulately. Um, and my belief is actually this pandemic is still being underappreciated underappreciated in what the long-term consequences of this will mean for, yes, public health, but far more for economics, for society, for trust, uh, and for the uh, inequalities uh, that this pandemic has exposed. Uh, in the way I frame it, I frame it in four concentric circles, um, and they are concentric because each one actually is bigger than the last one. And uh, I'll just go very quickly through what I mean by these. In the smallest, actually, at the heart of it, and it's difficult to say the smallest when we're living through it and the public health and uh, impact on all of our lives is so profound, but the one at the heart of this is, of course, the direct consequence of the infection itself, COVID-19, the impact on making people uh, sick, going to hospitals, the, uh, the tragedy of um, 500,000 deaths uh, already due to COVID-19. So the direct consequence of the infection. The second circle is the broader impact on the whole of health. Uh, when you disrupt health systems like this, it isn't just COVID that suffers and people with COVID, it's people with cancer, with diabetes, who, who require safe childbirth, uh, who demand vaccinations quite rightly so. Vaccination uh, around the world has dropped off a cliff over the last six months and the ramifications years from now will be felt as measles epidemics spread through Africa and other parts of the world. So there is the indirect health consequences of that. The third concentric ring is the impact on the broader society. Uh, health is paramount to all of us. And if health is not there for us, and particularly if public health systems and clinical facilities are not there when we need it, there is a question of trust between the governed and the governing. Uh, uh, economics is disrupted, trade is disrupted, the loss to the global economy but critically, national economies is profound. Uh, there is fear in every pandemic in history, going back to the Black Death in Europe in the Middle Ages, uh, these pandemics generate fear, particularly fear of outsiders, people who don't look like us, people who come from somewhere else. There is the blame game uh, that goes back again to the Middle Ages, and we're seeing it today. Um, when you put pressure on societies, as we have done through this pandemic, uh, it raises uh, it, uh, it opens up fractures which were there, and we all knew they were there, uh, but it raises those fractures even more, and it shows, in truth, what a fragmented society we have, driven essentially by inequalities. And whether that expresses itself, frankly, in the Black Lives Matter movement or inequalities in other parts of the world, uh, uh, it expresses itself and fractures are exposed. There's a whole generation of, of children that have not been at school for at least six months, and and that will devastate those children for many years to come. And it will particularly devastate those children who are living in countries where the language of the country is not their home language. It'll particularly devastate children from uh, vulnerable and other populations. And, and it will take years, if ever, they recover. Uh, it, will ex it will expose further inequalities. So the fracture lines in society, economics, trade, trust in government will be exposed and there will be uh, populist movements that uh, build on that fear. The fourth concentric ring is something Gordon also referred to, and that is geopolitics in a, in a single word. It is whether we believe in multilateralism. It is whether we seek to blame. 
America calling this the Wuhan or China virus, or other people saying this has come from somewhere else or whatever. It will call into question the very international frameworks that were established after the Second World War, whether the United Nations, the WHO, IMF, World Bank and others. It will lead to a rise in nationalism, a, a blame game that populists may be able to choose on. Um, and it will question those international relations in ways that uh, are unpredictable and very volatile and very frightening. And uh, without wishing to um, stretch the analogy too far, I think in the last hundred years, there have been two other occasions uh, where the world has been challenged to this sort of level, although I'm not trying to say it's the same. But in 1918 and 1945, we also went through, came out of uh, horrendous periods in human history. And at that moment, two moments, we faced a choice. Did we want to apportion blame? Did we want to impose reparations and say it was somebody else's fault? Or did we say that we can never do this again and we came together? In England, in Britain, uh, the National Health Service was created. Uh, the World Health Organization, the United Nations, uh, led to the development of the World Bank and the IMF and effectively a global architecture which brought countries together. And for all their faults, they have kept the world together uh, through all sorts of difficult periods uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and helped establish and maintain a degree of peace that was unknown. I'm the first generation in my family that did not have to go off to war. That's a remarkable thing to say. Um, what we're seeing playing out now is a retreat from that, a blame game, whether blaming this country or that country, or indeed withdrawing from agencies such as the World Health Organization uh, and effectively the United Nations or other multilateral organizations. And as we see science being developed through this, science is actually being used in ways to exaggerate that. We have the, the horrendous concept of vaccine nationalism, that if I make a vaccine, I will keep it to myself and my own citizens, and I will not share it with the world. And I would just pick out and praise Singapore here, who are leading an initiative led actually from a speech from their Prime Minister, Prime Minister Lee, talking about vaccine multi, uh, multilateralism and the need that once one has a vaccine or any other intervention for this pandemic, then it must be seen as a global public good and it, it must be shared equitably with all who uh, need it globally, which is effectively all of us. I think the other thing that this uh, pandemic has exposed is essential public services. There is such a thing as government, there is such a thing as society, and there is such a thing of investing in those elements that we all will use and we will all need. And when we need them, we need them to be there at a quality and, a, and an ability to respond both to uh, normal work, but also surge capacities. It reinforces for me, the critical need of public health, but also the other sectors which public investment is so critical, education, uh, public health, and everything that goes with it, including the commitment to global public good. Uh, debt relief, as Gordon again has led on over the last few months, is going to be critical to this. If we impose the debts that are gonna come through this uh, on countries, uh, we will lead to further fragmentation, weaker health systems, weaker educational systems, greater inequality, migration, and then we will be in a, a vicious spiral uh, where pandemics uh, are, are becoming uh, more frequent. Um, so we will face these inequalities and these challenges going forward. It is not though all pessimistic because we have choices uh, as we had choices in 1918 and 1945. But unless we make the underpinning intellectual argument, which is why universities and the LSE is so important in this, unless we make those cases now, then when we come through this eventual pandemic, eventually uh, that vacuum will have been filled by others. And if we look forward into the 21st century and we look at all of the great challenges uh, uh, that we face, uh, I would pick out from a scientist point of view, pandemics, emerging infections, but I would also include climate change, drug resistance um, and inequality and, and uh, movement of people uh, for whatever reason. If we don't make the case that these are global problems which need global solutions, then we will treat into a more nationalistic world of vaccine nationalism played out through climate change or anything else. And is that world that will lead us to the greatest challenges of our time. So I think this pandemic is actually much bigger than a health issue. It is a societal, it's a trust, and it's a geopolitical issue. And we must seize the moment. And the moment is now 
to make the case of why this is so important. And our generations will face that choice. And the choices we make will actually eventually define the 21st century. Eric, back to you. Thank you, Jeremy. I think you've shown very clearly how starting from that smaller circle from and looking at how the impact travels through different parts of, of, of our the system from the health to indirect health impact to broader societal impact to geopolitics and how in the end we really need both a global response and we need to think in a very systemic way of how we address this. Thank you very much, Jeremy. That was very um, enlightening. The next speaker is someone who is seeing all this transpire at, at a level of, of an individual country where the medical emergency and the economic crisis and, and many of the economic effects does not come from the country itself, but it comes from the outside and from all the impact on, on, on the, the global economy that's coming from, from this pandemic. It's, we have with us, uh, we're very honored to have it with us, uh, Maria Antonieta Alva or Tony Alva as she's known uh, to, to most people in, in Peru, her country. Um, she is the finance minister. She has uh, a, a, a training from our competitor, the Kennedy School at Harvard, and uh, she has gone back to serve her country and is doing so at a very difficult time. Uh, please, uh, Minister, you, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, Peru began the battle against the COVID with the strengths, but also with important weaknesses. I want to start highlighting what I consider to be the main lesson for the crisis in Peru. We cannot continue to be a country with a good macroeconomy and poor public services for its citizens. With respect to the macroeconomic strength, the Peruvian economy is one of the strongest and resilient economies in Latin America. We have a long track record of continuous growth and a successful fiscal and monetary policies for more than 20 years. Responsible fiscal management has allowed the construction of important fiscal space. The history of solvency and fiscal prudency reflected in the lowest levels of fiscal deficits and public debt in the region and are important assets for the crisis. However, COVID-19 has highlighted our weaknesses as a society. This has made these issues has made us very vulnerable in the crisis. For example, our country has a high level of informality, less penetration in the financial system, and deficient public services. More than 70% workers are in a situation of informality. In particular, there is a high rate of informality in the small businesses. In Peru, only 43% of the population of over 15 years old has access to banking system. This has been an important issue for implementing policies during the crisis. In contrast with economies with solid public services and better health systems to fight the pandemic, Peru's structural capacity to respond was weak. When the first case of coronavirus began on March 6, we decided to, de to defend life, which is a supreme end of the state according to our constitution. And for that reason, we established the longest and restricting quarantine and conf confin confinement in the world. We followed by letter what the epidemiology manual suggested in order to contain the advance of the virus. This quarantine and lockdown let us gain valuable time to strengthen our weak health system. Imagine this star in macroeconomic performance in Latin America. In March 15, when we started the lockdown, we only had 200 intensive care unit beds and only 2,000 hospital beds available for the, for the coronavirus. And we are 30, 35 million people here. So imagine this huge contrast between economic growth and between the quality of public services. This confinement make us gain, a, gain some time to build capacity. Now, by the end of this month, we are going to have 20,000 hospital beds and 2,000 intensive care unit beds. But we have done in this crisis more than we, the country had done in the last 30 years for the health system. This confinement that was very aggressive helped us moderate the rate of spread of the pandemic. This, when we started with the, with the lockdown, our R value was 3.2, and now we are around a one. 
throughout this uh, lockdown and throughout the crisis, the decisions taken by the government has been very complex and difficult because they carry a high economic and social cost for everyone. For instance, on April, our GDP fell 40%. For this reason, the government designed an economic plan that uses several policy tools with the objective of containing the effects of COVID and reactivating the economy. The plan is one of the most ambitious of the most ambitious in the in the region and the most ambitious that Peru has implemented and represented 17% of our GDP. It has been well received by the market and international organizations and uses a wide variety of policy instruments to maximize its impact. In particular, we have implemented tax measures, public spending measures, and well as other liquidity tools through the, re through the release of pension funds and different degrees. And we are working in two phases of the plan, containment and reactivation. Maybe the most, a uh, we have made aggressive uh, instruments mm -hmm. and maybe the most important are two. Our objective was to help families and to help companies and to support families. We uh, created these ambitious measures where, where we try to give subsidies to almost 80% of the households. The plan costs $6,000 million and we are going to cover 8 million homes. We had a lot of problems in delivering such subsidies because of our structural challenges of problems to uh, address where the peop where people was was because of informality, the low levels of banking and penetration. We don't have data of the household. So this ambitious um, subsidy plan had a lot of problems in the delivery because of a structural problems such as um, bank penetration of high informality. For companies, in coordination with the central bank, we created Reactiva Peru that provides liquidity and guarantee continuity in the, in the chain of payments. Uh, and, this, and this program represents eight points of the GDP. So we have, design, we have been very aggressive in designing measures, but because of structural problems, we have had problems implementing them, like the subsidies. Currently, the process of reactivation of the Peruvian economy is already underway in the line with a progressive reopening of our economy activities that consists in four phases. The resumption of economic activity is taking place progressively. We began with the phase one on May. It was followed by the phase two, and now we're in the phase three. Uh, and we are we think that the economy will operate around 90%, 96%, because when we did the lockdown, the economy uh, operated at 44%, and now it, it, it's at 96%. On the domestic side, the reopening process is already showing some favorable results for the economy. When we see these advanced indicators of economic activity, on April, we saw that the, the electricity production fell by 30%, and now in June, we are uh, falling by 12%. Mobility indicators are also in, increasing uh, since the beginning of April. So these, these days we see signs of improvement on the external and domestic side, <clears throat> which indicate that the worst in terms of economic and also health is the, the worst is over. And this gives us the confidence to know that we are in the way of the process of economic recovery. To my, my closing words is will be that the great lessons for the COVID is that macroeconomic matters, but the microeconomics too. We cannot think of being the first in the macro and the last in the micro and still be a sustainable economy. The crisis has revealed that in Peru, we need to solve fundamental problems. Otherwise, this will become a snowball that grows and grows. And this will, um, and I consider the lesser effectiveness on Peruvian policies during the crisis is attributed to three reasons. The high rate of informality, the low levels of financial inclusion, and the great deficiency in the quality of public services. I think that this has to be the agenda for the next years. We need a social consensus in Peru, just as a civil society, the government and political parties agreed 30 years ago that macroeconomic stability was very important for the country and we have built institutions and tools. We need to have this new consensus about that. We need to tackle all these problems for the next years and in our country to be developed. To conclude, 
we are all aware that the current circumstances we're going through are challenging and require us to give our best effort. The current crisis has revealed the need to continue more, working more than ever to close the existing gaps in, in my country. Peru has been able to overcome great crisis. We have the shining path. We have the economic depression in the 90s. And throughout the history, we have overcome this crisis. And this will not be the exception. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Alba. That was um, a very vivid and, and uh, interesting account of how the ch challenges look at the, at the frontier, so to say. And it, it's impressive how your government has the level of ambition and, and how you also deal with this, what you call structural problems. So thank you very much for giving us that, that account. The next speaker is uh, Chu Min. He's the former uh, deputy managing director of the IMF, uh, also deputy governor of the People's Bank of China. He was involved in the eminent persons group, which spoke about the need to reform the global financial system, the, both the development architecture and the, and the uh, global safety net. You, you, have, you come from a country that had to deal with uh, this in the first place in, with, without any information uh, you had to, and without, with no time to, to react. Uh, how do you see um, this uh, crisis playing out uh, in terms of the global response and maybe also in, in terms of your own country's uh, response? Please. Yeah. Drew. Thank you, uh, thank you, Eric, for the very kind of words of uh, introduction. And also thank you, Eric and Minosh, for the kind of invitation. It is a great, great honor for me to join this very, very distinguished panel. And uh, it's also a, a pleasure to share some of my thoughts with the audience. Um, I particularly appreciate Mr. Gordon Brown lay out a very broad and ground structures of the challenges we are facing today from medical health crisis to economic crisis to low-income country, poor country crisis. I think the three points that he made is absolutely important. Everybody should uh, look into it. The first, it is a global health crisis. Unless we solve this issue, that means we contain the pandemic COVID-19, will not be able to solve economic, financial, and low-income country crisis. I think that's absolutely, absolutely starting point. But the second point also important, he says in the current global political environment, it looks like we'll have to go through the issue by issue method to solve the problem piece by piece. I think that's practically, it's a very important. The third point he made also important at the end of his conclusion, he says, even with issue by issue, multinationalism is the only principle to guide us move forward. I think it's also absolutely important. So we, with the, the really the key message he laid out, I'm going to go a little further from there to provide some my Chinese experience and see how, what we need to do particularly today as the topic says, what should we do now? What are we now today? We are still in the middle of healthcare crisis, right? I mean, COVID-19 still on exponentially increasing pass, although 10 million people infected, half a million people passed. We still don't see the turning point yet. And more than that, we still don't know whether we may be facing the second wave to come back in the coming November and the winter. I think that's the real serious challenge, the starting point for everyone in the world to think about that. I think those, are, and because the global in a such a series of recessions, we all in a sort of half open, half closed situation. When I say half open, that's mean we try to reopen the economy, bring the life gradually back to normal. But when we say the half close, that's mean we still have to combat the fight with the pandemics. So this is a really difficult situation with very high plateaus. And I mean, in fact, the people there, we got to be very careful. 
in this situation, I think three things is really key, particularly in the medical areas to fight is COVID-19. And also, once again, let me echo Mr. Gordon Brown says that multinationalism is the only principle should guide us move forward. The first, obviously, as Mr. Gordon and Jeremy mentioned, is we need the vaccines, we need a special treatment of medicine, that's, that's very true. But in the process, I think we need more country companies committed resource and also committed if the vaccine de developed should be global public goods and distribute to the people most needed. I think this is the most important thing. There are more than 100 teams working on those things. China have five in the leading stages on the second phase test. China put a lot of efforts and looking for the global cooperation. And also China made a commitment if the vaccine being developed should be the global public goods as a Singapore and a few other countries. We should get more country in, on this camp and uh, supporting this vaccine and the special medical treatments issues. I think those are the most urgent issue. However, more than that, in the current situation, the medical uh, surprise is the most shortage and urgent needed issue. So we need to make sure the medical surprise can move freely across the board with zero tariff, with exper express past and pass a zero customer sort of time and make sure can free move across the board. The one case China can win the battle in roughly two months control of really serious situations. We get all the medical supplies from the whole countries move into Wuhan city. So we'll be able to bring 42,000 doctors and nurses to the city and build the 60,000 uh, hospital beds in two weeks. The same thing, we need the medical supplies to move freely across the board in the whole world. I think it, we need a trade deal on the medical supplies. Take example, we all talk about uh, the really the ventilator machines. The machine have a 15,000 uh, 1500 parts and involving 114 companies across 14 countries. We need to increase the capacity, but we need all those companies, countries sit down to talk from South Korea, China, to Swiss, to United States. Otherwise, we'll not be able to meet the demands. I think that's the first issue. The second issue is also urgently needed is we need uh, to build, I call the TTTT system in a half open, half closed, closed, closed uh, situation. The TTTT mean testing, tracing, tracking, and the treatments. It got to be the smart and agile system. Because any time when things happen, we need to have an army to move quickly respond to those things. You may heard in Beijing, there's a small scale outbreak in Beijing city you know, near a, a farmer uh, market which obviously is a big concern. So what China did, and we quickly identified roughly 300,000 people visited this farmer market in first half of June. Use what? Use AR and big data technology. Then we give all those people tests and we quickly found roughly more than 350 people infected and the quarantism sent them to the hospital. Meanwhile, we quickly give everybody, I mean, focus the group, like uh, people work in the restaurants, deliveries, hospitals, you know, bus, transportations, school students, the test. So then we will be able to measure everything down in roughly in two weeks. Now it's really under control now. So I observe the system works very well. And I think the whole world need to build more or less the same system across board from advanced economy to emerging market to low income country as well. Could you once again require global cooperation, require uh, shared experience, technology uh, uh, um, uh, sharing, and also resource location su support, 
But I think at this moment, every country have to build the same system because we don't know when and where those things will come back. The third point I think is also important at this time, I think, and we need the, the quickly expand uh, the capacity of the public health system. We cannot wait until the post the pandemic issues, until everything's open, because it's a fight with the life, for the life. That's mean including the fever clinic networking systems, in, including uh, the, 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 the survey teams, uh, tracking, tracing, uh, a serving team capacity building, including big data, AR systems, and including medical uh, supplies, equipments, and uh, reserves, and also, and also particularly including a capacity you can quickly expand the hospital bed when things come back. Once again, they need a global cooperation. Some country may have the capacity can do that quickly. Some country may not. But I think we need to make sure every country have this capacity so they can quickly respond to early emergency and cases when it happen. Because we simply just don't know. This is an unknown situation, which once again, and require the global cooperation and the multinationalism is the only principle to guide us forward. So once again, I really appreciate Mr. Gordon Brown mentions so we have to solve this med medical crisis so first of focus issue by issue and also and only with that we'll be able to rebuild the trust we'll be able to solve the economic and financial crisis and we'll be able to bring the whole world the back and once again the multinationalism is really the only principle can lead and can guide us move forward thank you thank you very much Thank you, Jumin. I think that was a very powerful uh, argument in favor of global collaboration. You pointed to the need to have the global public good for vaccines. You pointed to the trade deal on medical supplies. You spoke about this TTT technology that you, I think China has shown can work very effectively. And finally, you spoke about, which I think we always come back to, we need to invest in healthcare everywhere because pandemics, we don't know where they're gonna come and when they're gonna come. And in the end, they are the test of, of whether we can uh, save lives or not. So thank you very much, uh, Jumin. Last but not least, uh, Minur Shafiq, uh, who is of course now the director of LSE, but has a long career behind her in, in, um, in both internationally in the World Bank, in the IMF as deputy managing director, and also as deputy governor of the uh, Bank of England. You also worked at some point, uh, and I think that is always with you, this uh, sense of uh, development. And, and uh, you worked as, as um, in charge of, of DFID here in, in the UK. And that sense of, of really understanding how things work on the ground has always been with you. So Minush, what is your take on, on, on this? Thank you, Eric. Well, first, just to say, I very much agree with the points that were made by Gordon, by Jeremy, by Maria, and by Min. And I thought what I would do is, uh, is uh, focus on another very important thing we need to do now, which is to lay the policy groundwork so that this crisis doesn't go to waste. We know from history that some crises fundamentally change the world, the Great Depression, World War II. But we also know that some crises don't actually change the world fundamentally. And one can think of World War I or even the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, and sometimes the fact that we didn't make big changes after those crises come back to haunt us. And I think both Jeremy and Gordon alluded to that. Now, this crisis could go either way. It could fundamentally change the world, or it, we could kind of patch it up and muddle through without much fundamentally changing. I believe that many of the issues that ailed us before the COVID crisis and the COVID crisis revealed so dramatically is the fact that our existing social contract doesn't work. 
and that we need a new social contract. And Minister Alva alluded to that when she talked about the need for a new social consensus in Peru, for example. Let me illustrate what I mean by that. We need a new social contract in health. Every country in the world can afford to deliver a minimum level of health care for everyone. WHO has a core package of reproductive health, immunization, infectious disease treatment for pneumonia, TB, malaria, and things like COVID, and recommends that most countries spend about 5% of GDP on that core health package. There is no excuse post-COVID to not deliver on that. Similarly, we need a new social contract between workers and their employers. It is it is very interesting. And Minister Alba referred to the, the informal sector and how much that was hit by this crisis. What I think is very interesting is that the informal sector is now also prevalent in advanced economies, not just developing countries. And huge proportions of our workforces around the world have jobs in which they have very little regularity around hours, sick pay, pensions, and, and any sort of benefit. And I think it's very interesting how the, that group of precarious workers often coincided with those who were deemed essential during the COVID crisis. I think that situation can no longer persist after this crisis. I think in both advanced and developing countries, we need to reduce that level of informality, that all workers need to be brought into more normal contracts in which unemployment insurance, pensions, and sick leave are offered, including those workers who are operating on a flexible basis, short-term, part-time, and so-called gig workers. Uh, there is no excuse why we cannot do that. Similarly, we know we're entering a period in which there'll be big structural changes in the labor market, and there will be unemployment. And at this point, a social contract that delivers much more in terms of reskilling workers for the jobs of the future is absolutely essential. And with the rare exception of a couple of Nordic countries who invest seriously in reskilling their workforces and then have high productivity and unemployment as a benefit, most countries in the world grossly underinvest in that. And we must do that now as part of a new social contract to anticipate that unemployment and reduce its negative consequences. We also need a new social contract between men and women. Now, while men have borne much of the health, bur health burden of this particular crisis. Women have also borne quite a heavy burden in terms of caring and their economic roles. A new social contract could have a huge benefit. This is the first generation in which there are more women graduating from university than men. And that is a huge talent pool that can contribute to productivity and growth in our economies but we can't tap into it properly if those women are all doing two hours more of unpaid work globally than their male, than their male partners. And so a rebalanced social contract between men and women will position us to actually take advantage of the huge productivity gains that we could get from better using female talent. And then finally, we need a new social contract between the generations. We know that the elderly have borne a huge burden from this crisis and it has revealed the failings of our system for looking after the elderly. And it will, it also, we also know very well that our systems for providing financial security for the elderly and through pensions is unsustainable in most countries, particularly those that are aging. But we also know that we're leaving the young generation with a huge legacy of debt. In the advanced economies, most countries have added between 10 and 20% of GDP to their debt stocks as a result of this crisis, and we're not done yet. We're also leaving them with a legacy of environmental debt and the destruction on climate and biodiversity and so on. And so we need a new deal between the generations, one that compensates the young generation for this, this debt legacy that we've left them. We as the older generation need to do what we can to fix as much of it as we can. But for example, I would love to see every young person around the world being given an educational entitlement for their lives, a significant sum which they can use to invest in their own skills over the course of their work lives, which will make them more productive and will enable them to pay the taxes that will pay for the health care and the pensions for the older generation. And I think that kind of new 
social contract between the generations could provide the basis for a much more sustainable economic future. Finally, I'd just say, unless we start the debate on these issues to address the medium term failures of our social contract that this crisis has revealed, we will, we will let this crisis go to waste. We're starting to do that at the LSE under the umbrella of terms like build back better or what does the post COVID world look like. Uh, and I very much hope that the Merriam Forum can contribute to helping us advance that debate on what a new social contract might be for a better world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minush. So we have a, a lot of questions. I have a, a brought in some help. Piroska Noj Mohaji, who is a program director at IDA, worked also at the IMF and the EBRD. She's going to help me uh, pose some questions. So please, Piroska. Thank you very much, Eric. And uh, after this brilliant panel, the questions are indeed flowing in. Maybe I can start with one that we have to answer ourselves. There was a question, general question about the name of the initiative. It's Mariam Initiative. So why is it? First of all, um, and most importantly, it is rooted in the a very old ancient Aramaic word. And it appears in almost own languages. We know Mary, we know Miriam and, and the variants of this. So it is across regions, across religions. And we saw that this really reflects the, the global nature of our initiative. And secondly, it's a woman name. So for a leadership initiative, it's nice to have a woman name. And uh, our uh, uh, supporter, uh, Kaidi Ahani, uh, very much was in favor of this. But now really getting down to the questions for the panel itself. Um, maybe I start uh, the one. Uh, to Madam Minister uh, of Finance, um, asking a very pertinent question that comes up in a number of countries, that in the case of, of your country, Peru, to what extent one can take advantage of the crisis and really initiate needed reforms? Can you build consensus for reforms? So that would be uh, one question. A question for, for Prime Minister Gordon Brown is, um, uh, repeatedly coming from several people, uh, um, AMP Lati or Gospal uh, Shakar from India, asking the same similar question, where exactly leadership today can come from? We see a failure of leadership, all the speakers um, uh, highlighted this. Who can you know, make this happen? What are the incentives that need to be uh, given um, um, to the potential leaders or existing leaders to, uh, uh, to deliver the leadership that that uh, we, we really need. And, and finally, perhaps uh, uh, the third question in this group is, is a more positive question linking to, um, uh, to our very own uh, director, uh, Minouche's uh, um, social contract, uh, revis revis social contract uh, issue and within it, the issue of, 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 of uh, the restructuring of the labor market. Can you point, uh, asks uh, D. Saus, can you point to areas where there would be more demand for new jobs, particularly for the young? Which are the areas that, that uh, in, even in the midst of the crisis, we can look positively and identify um, uh, you know, some uh, positive areas for, for, for job growth? So um, may, the, may, may I start with the, uh, Madam Minister? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think that uh, of course, we we already uh, we are already concerned about uh, how we can gain uh, opportunity from this crisis. I think that during that crisis, we were able to introduce some changes that were very difficult to introduce before the crisis. For instance, regarding the regarding the medicine market, mm -hmm. the medicine market is a is a market which has lost lost levels of competence. Mm -hmm. So we were able uh, when we had to give these basic medicines for the COVID we were able to introduce some changes in the rules of that market that were impossible to be introduced before. For instance, we decided that laboratories can directly sell medicines to citizens. That was a, a, a change that, that we were looking for many years ago that was not possible. So this, the, this crisis uh, led us a huge opportunity to change some things, especially related to how uh, markets were have more competitiveness. 
And the second issue is related to more structural reforms. Now, um, a priority of the country is a financial inclusion. And this is very interesting because mm -hmm. uh, now uh, private banks have understood that they need to help the country in this process. Uh, because uh, we had like banks, when we gave these subsidies, uh, people to start to, to like the banks, all the offices of the banks, the agencies of the banks were spaces where people can, um, like were like infection focus. So they, we start to work with them. We work on how we're going to deliver the subsidy, but now we are working together. They, I think that they are understanding that we are part of an ecosystem of social and social of financial inclusion, and they are willing to help us. The other important thing is related to health. I really um, think that this is a huge opportunity to do a reform in the in the health system. And for me, it's very relevant. We now now we have um, elections next year, and of course, uh, when you are um, with high levels of unemployment, we, when we are when you are in an economic crisis these uh, populist speeches are, are more strong. So for us, it's very important in this, we, are, we have one year before the next government uh, starts. So for us, it's going to be very important to build consensus around, I think, three topics around how we do a more aggressive reform in the health system, how we do a more aggressive reform in the financial inclusion, and here we need collaboration between private and, and public. Uh, sector. And the third is uh, formality. We have a huge problem of formality. 70% of our labor force is informal. So I think that this crisis uh, has uh, helped us to build this consensus. 30 years ago, when we were in the middle of an economic crisis, we built a consensus regarding how we want to handle our economy. And I think that is a great opportunity of how we want to make this step, how we want to develop our country. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was brilliant and very nicely feeding into uh, Director Minush's uh, uh, thinking of, 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 of grabbing the moment to, to have a new social, building a new social contract. Uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, Gordon Brown, may I call you on this leadership question? And I, I would ask also maybe uh, Jeremy Ferrar as well and, and uh, zoom in if they wish to speak to that. Yeah, this goes to the heart, I think, of the, the problems that people see. And I'm not surprised we have questions from all over the world. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, after all, um, the, the G20 met three times to deal with the financial crisis. It's not going to meet until November. Um, they couldn't get an agreed resolution on health in the uh, global uh, G20 Health Committee. When it came to the United Nations, the Security Council has been unable to agree a resolution uh, on this. And even last week, when the Security Council was considering a, a resolution at its 75th anniversary, uh, they couldn't agree on the use of this term, our common future. It sounds almost uh, ludicrous. Uh, and in fact, it was the United Kingdom that pulled out from this phrase, our common future, which was after all the term that was used by Gro Harlan Brundtland when she did a report uh, some, some, some years ago. So I can understand the pessimism, but look, look, look at the opposite uh, side of the picture now. First of all, if you look at any global opinion poll, people do in almost every country where I've seen these polls, want cooperation, particularly on this issue of health. So people want people to come together and they want cooperation. When we did this letter that Eric and many others, Jeremy were so instrumental in making possible, 230 leaders from all over the world who'd been prime ministers, presidents or chief economists of this or that, wanted to sign this letter, wanted to, 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 be, to be part of it. When one G20 was, was actually called, it was India and Australia who pushed for it. So surprising, perhaps, but some countries that you might not have expected would want this cooperation are pushing for it. And what I also see is Arthur Schlesinger said that the world uh, moved between cycles of individualism and collectivism. And at one generation, uh, people were pursuing individual self-interest, almost a neoliberal position. In another generation, people reacted to that and wanted uh, community um, organization of uh, public health, of education, and wanted to support uh, public services. And I do believe that there is some evidence uh, that uh, people are changing their mind about the importance they attach uh, to cooperative action. I, I, I do believe that people have changed, the balance between risk and security is changing. People are not prepared to take these risks. They want governments to do more about security, whether it's health or employment. 
Equally at the same time, uh, government has become uh, not just uh, the uh, lender of last resort, it's been the employer of last resort in many countries, and people see the importance of collaborative action to deal with things. So I would be less pessimistic. And one of the things that is happening in the last few weeks, actually, is that the populist nationalist leaders, and I'm not going to name them, but uh, uh, to embarrass people about their own countries, but the populist nationalist leaders seem to be losing support. I think uh, people do understand more than we think uh, that we have actually a common future and we have got to work together. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Jeremy, would you like to add something uh, uh, to this leadership issue? No, other than to say, um, I think this comes from civic society. Um, you know, if we go back to those analogies I used in the, in the 20th century, I mean, it, it was civic society that said we'll never do we can never do this again um and i think this health crisis which has yes affected everybody but has affected everybody inequitably um it is uh it's a it's for the youth who, who have been affected through education and other things and uh, who who must get engaged in politics must influence politics and must that use their voice so that the leaders that gordon mentioned can hear that voice and it doesn't get drowned out by those populist movements. And I think that is the, the reason for actual optimism in this. It's people that get together and say never again. And, uh, and this has affected everybody's lives. Thank you very much. Uh, Minzu, would you like to add, uh, is there a geo geopolitical dimension perhaps uh, to this leadership question? Obviously. Obviously, can you hear? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, obviously there's a nationalism, there's a populism around you know, these issues. I mean, I mean, if you're looking for history, when you have a pandemic sort of a crisis, people tend to scared and they tend to go to individualism and also nationalism tend to be strong as those things happen. But I think uh, this time quickly, people more and more realize this is a global health crisis you have to get all the people working together, all the country working together. No one alone can solve this crisis. I think it's become ever, ever clear, right? Because the virus ha have no nations and uh, across the board, more, whatever. So I think this has become ever clear now. But there's a challenge. Because when you see geopolitical issues, the, the real challenge is how do we solve those issues, right? I mean, the noise is there, so clearly in, in those type of situations, if you're looking back to history, it's always happened. But recall in 2008, uh, Mr. Gordon Brown is here, right? In, in London meeting and G20 Pittsburgh meeting. I mean, the, the issue is, is really focused. It's a liquidity issue, right? It's a trust and confidence issue, and it's aggregate demand issue. So quickly, the leader can bring the people together on those issues, bring the whole world more forward. But today, the situation is much, much more complicated, right? There's healthcare, you know, and dimensions, there are medical supply dimensions, there are technology dimensions, there are security dimensions, there are social contract dimensions. You know, there's so many, and the resource dimensions, and also income inequality, and the rich against the poor within country, across the board. So there's so many things here. So go back to Gordon Brown's point. We do issue by issue methods. I think, I, I, I think there's a lot of noise, that's is very true. But the key issue, the reason also I appreciate this forum is a school like RSE should play important role on intellectual debating and found the policy ground so we can move forward. Thank you very much. And finally, in this round, um, can I call on uh, our own director, uh, Minush, regarding the job, where, where good jobs will be coming from, particularly for the young? I know that uh, there is some uh, anxiety about automation, uh, eliminating jobs. I am not a believer that humans are going to become obsolete. I think automation both substitutes for labor, but also complements labor. 
And you know, I think this crisis has shown us how much we can do digitally. Uh, look at us today. Mm -hmm. And I think we've all had a bit of a revelation as to how much we can get done digitally. But I think we've also all felt acutely uh, that it isn't a substitute for human contact. And I think the future is going to be this combination uh, of high tech and high touch. Think of healthcare. Uh, you know, in healthcare going forward, you know, people said, oh, people would never accept to do telemedicine and talk to a doctor online. Well, we've all had to, and we've all adjusted. Yes. And that is going to reduce healthcare costs dramatically. Similarly, healthcare workers are going to have, you know, there's now very low cost diagnostic tools which can monitor vital signs, which people could even have afford to have at home, uh, which will enable quicker diagnostics. But people will still want to talk to a medical professional about their treatment and get advice. Uh, and I think the future of jobs is going to be at that interface between the digital world and the high, the high tech and the high touch world. And that applies in education, that applies in the law profession, that applies across the board. So I think having digital fluency, but having skills in other domains is where the jobs of the future will be. Thank you very much. Uh, Eric, would you like to uh, do the next round of questions? I can I can try. So, so uh, <laughs> I know that uh, uh, there is a question around vaccines and how we can deal with uh, the, sort of the intellectual property rights and how can we really get effective distribution, production uh, of these vaccines. And I thought that since we have Jeremy here who has been one of the global drivers of this, what is your response? What is needed to make this happen? Sufficient production, sufficient distribution that really reaches everybody. Yeah, it's a huge issue of the, of the moment. Actually, in intellectual property is a really vexed issue. And actually, in reality, on the vaccine side, intellectual property is less of an issue than it is in other areas of medicine. Uh, intellectual property will not be the, the, the problem here. The, the problem will be, firstly, proving something is safe and proving something is effective. You're potentially going to roll out a vaccine to healthy people, potentially 7 billion of them, uh, you need to be absolutely sure it is safe and you need to be absolutely sure it's providing protection against the infection. And it does so in a young child and it does so in a very senior individual. That's unusual. That's an unusual scientific challenge. We usually give vaccines to very young people. We're certainly going to be wanting to target very senior people with these vaccines. That's an enormous scientific challenge. The key to getting this rolled out at the global level is that we don't allow vaccine nationalism to take over. Uh, that we pool our risks, because I've no idea which of the 200 vaccines in development is going to work. Um, they won't all work, uh, but some of them will, and they may come from Cuba or China or Russia, America, Europe. They may come from South Africa. We've no idea, but you will know the whole world will, will want it, and therefore we should be pooling our risks. We put, should be broadening our portfolios, and we should make sure that we provide equitable access. And actually, this is an opportunity because instead of only manufacturing in half a dozen countries around the world, this will actually allow the democratization of manufacturing of vaccines. This will allow vaccine manufacturers across Asia, Africa, Central South America to get established to provide these vaccines, but potentially then in the future, other vaccines of critical need. And I actually see this as a turning point in vaccine manufacturing globally. Technology will improve and it may lead us to having actually a more equitable access to vaccines in the long term. It's a moment to grasp, but what we must avoid is the vaccine nationalism that we've uh, referred to earlier. Gordon Brown, there, there are questions about um, the Addis Ababa commitment for finance for development and uh, was viewed as sort of the, the high peak of, of uh, multilateralism, the, what happened in Paris and then what happened in Addis Ababa. What, what, what do you see can be done to fulfill those promises? And, and there's a follow-up question to that. What is the role of the private sector? Could, there was a, a lot of talk in, in Addis Ababa about the, the private sector. How do you see that? Uh, rem remember in Addis uh, Ababa, uh, the whole idea was to mobilize private resources behind public goals. So 150 billion of an aid budget, perhaps 500 billion of remittances, which, which are falling at the moment, as you probably know, about 500 billion of corporate philanthropy, 
but unless we could mobilize the private sector, so you had SDG related investments, so you had the ESG objectives that they set being met, then we would not be able to meet the sustainable development goals. So we are behind, we are bound to see them further beyond our reach as a result of what's happening at the moment as more people for the, well, for the first time, poverty numbers are rising for 30, 30 years and standards of living are falling for millions of uh, people. Education is falling back because people are uh, transferring resources to other things. Health may have got new investment, but as Jeremy really uh, very eloquently pointed out, other health conditions are being, being neglected. So we have to increase the pressure, in my view, on the private sector. And I think one of the things that is um, going to happen in the next few months is impact weighted accounting is going to become an important element of how a company presents itself to the world. So you present your profit and loss accounts, but you present accounts that show the impact, uh, what you are doing as a company. I mean, uh, Alan Job at Unilever says, every product must have a purpose. The impact your company is making on achieving the sustainable uh, development uh, goals. And you can do it for environmental um, uh, effects, you can do it for social um, effects, and Black Lives Matters is raising the issue of uh, discrimination within in, in, in employment. Uh, and of course, you can do it for the uh, what advances have been made in health and education. So Addis Ababa actually was about how the private sector could be mobilized behind public goals, as well as the aid budgets. And I think we have uh, got a lot of announcements like at Davos in January from companies saying, we will do more, we want to do more, we're gonna do this, a billion trees, this and that. Mm -hmm. What we've actually got to do is to get this into practical changes that companies can identify and prove and not just have it as part of the rhetoric. And I think uh, look to impact weighted accounting. And I think in 10 years time, governments around the world will be compelling companies uh, to present their accounts uh, with the impact that they are achieving as well as their profit and losses accounts. And I think that is a major step forward that could make a difference. We have 10 years until 2030 and we've got to do a lot in the next few years to make this happen. Thank you very much. There, there is a question here that I think is, is very important and it goes to some of the uh, problems of delivering, uh, even when we can agree on things, delivering on the ground. And it's the, the role of informality. And, and uh, we know that 60% of the global economy is informal. What, from your experience in, in Peru, uh, Minister Alba, how have you addressed this and how do you deal with the, this issue? Or you spoke a little bit about you know, trying to get this money that you have appropriated to really reach those in need. How do you go about that? That's a question from uh, several people um, in the audience. Sorry, uh, it's a huge challenge. Uh, in fact, uh, when we started with the lockdown, it, it was around uh, March 15. Uh, we first identified 6 million households, uh, but it's amazing, like it's incredible that we don't have like a real database of all the citizens of the country. So we had to open a new process where people uh, start like to, to present themselves in a, in, a, in a register and after two or three months, we just finally defined the new two million households that need this, this subsidy. So that was, the, the, that was a real issue. But uh, as I already said, this is a huge opportunity. It's the first time that our country has a very comprehensive database of all the households. And this will definitely uh, improve the quality of the policies that, we're going, that, that we are designing. Regarding um, formality in the in the labor market we are considering i think that uh, what the country has hasn't been uh, doing in the right way is that uh, we need to think about uh, labor reforms in addition to tax reforms i think that we have been as a country thinking that they were very different policies but we we have learned that all the incentives in the tax uh, system has to be very uh, relative to the labor system. So we are going to we are working on a new uh, scheme for especially small businesses, and we are trying to reduce all the costs of, of formality. But I am, it, it's very, it's a very structural um, and huge uh, problem. But we are starting to do some steps on 
and we are going to, to present to the next government some structural uh, proposals to, ta to tackle this problem. Thank you very much. We are coming close to, to the end here and uh, we have with us um, my close colleague and, and dear friend Andres Velasco who has um, been of course uh, important now in as our first founding director of the School of Public Policy but before mm -hmm. that with a career in, um, in his home country, Chile, uh, but also as a finance minister there, but also uh, working in the, Harvard, uh, the Kennedy School at Harvard and at uh, Columbia. Please, Andres, how do you, when you look at this debate you've had, what, what do you take away as the main points? And why, before I get give the floor to you, I encourage everyone to, to follow the students are, uh, polling us as we speak, and and uh, you can go to menti.com and type in the code five six four three six, and then there are a couple of questions that are meant to capture the the sentiments of the of the audience and and what you take away from from this conversation. So please, Andres, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Barack Obama after he became president of the United States, used to, used to say, only in America, only in America could he have become president. As I listen to this extraordinary debate, to this very diverse panel with great insights, I am tempted to say, only at the LSE. <laughs> only at the LSE could you have uh, an event like this. And of course, I, I have no doubt, Eric, that uh, the Mariam Forum, uh, of which this is only the first iteration, will be you know, yet another big and important contribution to keep this very strong LSE tradition of engagement and dialogue going. I will not attempt to summarize everything that has been said in this very rich discussion, but perhaps let me just emphasize two points that strike me as particularly important also particularly urgent given the nature of what we're living through. One is the point that uh, Gordon Brown, Jeremy, Eric, and all the other people who signed those two letters have made repeatedly. Uh, 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 regrettably, we've repeated it, but uh, we don't seem to be getting anywhere. And the point is very simple. The international community is failing developing countries and emerging markets around the globe in making sufficient funds available sufficiently quickly. Back of the envelope numbers, the IMF estimates that developing countries need 2.5 trillion. And uh, the IMF, in the best of circumstances, can lend 1 trillion. And the truth is that in practice, Minush may correct me here, can lend a lot less than one trillion. So maybe the fund is in a position to provide one third of what the world needs. The World Bank, the regional development banks have great ideas, but truth is very limited firepower. And the countries like Peru, thanks to the leadership uh, of ministers like, like Minister Alva, the countries that have access to market on fairly unrestricted terms are few and far between. So there's a large category of countries out there which would like to do antivirus, anti-unemployment, pro-growth packages to the tune of 10, 12, or 15 percent of GDP, but they simply don't have the money. I heard this very pithily put recently by my friend, the former finance minister of Colombia, Mauricio Cardenas, who said there are two countries or two kinds of countries in the world. There are those in Europe uh, and North America that can say, we will do whatever it takes, echoing, of course, what the ECB uh, president said a few years back. Europe did whatever it takes. And in fact, it seems to, be have, to have saved the Euro, so far at least. Um, but then there are other countries, uh, as Minister Cardenas said, who do not say, we will do whatever it takes. They can only say, we will do whatever we can afford. And regrettably, what they can afford is way too little. And we're seeing that in mounting contagion rates, mounting death tolls, and very dim prospects for economic growth. 
And it would be a real tra tragedy if because of this international failure in the next few years, we saw many countries sliding back into poverty, into greater destitution, into worse inequality that we have seen so far. I think that's the bad news. And uh, at this point, it is sort of obvious, but it needs to be repeated. Now, on a, on a more positive side, what, what, what I heard from several of you, and I think has been a constant through the very successful series of LSE public events, is that uh, as Minouche aptly put it, we should not let this opportunity go to waste. And the political economy equilibrium uh, in some areas is being shifted uh, in a way that can make reform possible. Let me give you one very concrete example. Minister Alva was very eloquent in discussing the evils of informality in the labor market. We have known for decades that informality in the labor market is bad. It shouldn't be necessary to say it. We all know that. And the reason why we haven't addressed it is purely political because addressing informality needs cutting back on regulation and bureaucrats might not like that. It might require modifying the labor code and some kinds of modifications get the business lobby very uh, irate. Other kinds of modifications get traditional unions that typically represent older male workers uh, very irate as well. And as a result, given that labor reform is a thorny issue, many governments say, I will lead that to my successor. Um, and way too many nations today have 30%, 50%, 65%, 70% of the labor, labor force working without a contract, without benefits, without any kind of job stability. That can be avoided. And I would like to think that after this tremendous shock that we have all lived through, uh, the different veto players, the diff different uh, lobby groups, and politicians of all colors might say, look, informality is something we can tackle. It is, well, of course, doing so takes a bit of money, but money is not at the center here. It is political will. So maybe the positive outgrowth, the byproduct uh, of this crisis is that in areas like labor reform, informality, welfare systems, the political equilibrium has been shaken some of those vetoes might fade away and we could do exactly the kinds of things that Minister Alva was calling for. Let me leave it at that uh, cautiously optimistic note. Thank you, everyone.